Hey everyone, just coming to you with this public service announcement. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. So let me explain. First and foremost, it's free to do so. You don't got to come out of your pocket. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and a whole bunch of other platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. That's why I got on it. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. All right. Peace. for the live stream now. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and um, go right into it. All right. Welcome everyone to Masterminds with Brother Shem L. I'm your host, Brother Shem L, and I have a special guest here today. I know a lot of you have been uh, excited about this. I'm excited about this. This is an honor and a privilege. Um, uh, what I can say about this, this man um, really would not truly capture all of this man's impact, uh, not only to the Morse movement, um, not only to uh, African scholarship, but to academia as a whole and the whole aspect of us seeking truth. We're in an era right now where many of us are seeking the truth. We're um, tired of being lied to. And this man has played a, a very important part in revealing that truth for many decades. Um, this man has uh, worked with some of the greatest um, scholars of our time, the late great, uh, Dr. Uh, Ivan Van Sertema, who many of you are aware of with his great work entitled um, Golden Age of the Moors, which is out of print. So if you have that, you definitely have a treat. Uh, this man is also known for his uh, work on the Amexum YouTube channel, uh, Honest to Them. Um, if you've seen what he's spoken on, he's dropping plenty of jewels on that. Um, and the list goes on and on. I will let him speak on it. Um, I just found out that this brother is uh, from my stomping grounds, Long Island. I'm from Long Island. So <laughs> praise Allah. Um, Allah. <laughs> so without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce to you my esteemed guest and my brother, Dr. Jose Pimienta Bay. Dr. Bay, welcome to our show. Thank you, brother Shamil. Thank you. You know, every time I listen to any kind of introduction and I realize, like you were saying, the different people I've had the pleasure of either studying with or working with, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to believe. It's, it is, as they say, uh, some might say a charmed life or we would recognize as a, as a blessed life to be able to have cross paths with people like Dr. Van Sertima and people like Dr. Malefi Asante and Dr. Malena Karenga, and, uh, uh, you know, Dr., uh, well, formerly known as Dr. Wade Nobles and, and others, and Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. I mean, the list uh, is extensive. And even uh, one of my late mentors, um, Dr. C. Tessalon Cato, who was a historian originally from South Africa. So, uh, you know, having the opportunity to have known such esteemed brothers and sisters during this this sojourn, this lifetime, really is is um, as I say, it's a it's a blessing. And any opportunity to be able to share additional information, you know, about uh, who we are, uh, you of course know. In the context of more science, we emphasize know thyself, and we also recognize as something that has Nile Valley civilization. Uh, roots, although we can look at different cultures and say that know thyself is across the globe and, and I dare say even uh, off this earth plane, um, the reality is that 
Nile Valley civilization, something that we see uh, an important aspect uh, uh, within our own understanding of Islam or Islamism, uh, says know thyself before knowing anything else. Because the secret, if you will, to our ability to manifest love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice to the best of our ability requires that journey of know thyself. Absolutely. So I appreciate the chance to perhaps share something within the next um, you know, hour uh, or so. Gratitude, I appreciate it. And um, also we're gonna get into your work, um, Othello's Children in the New World. But before we get into that, uh, would you mind um, sharing with the audience a little background on yourself as far as how did you, one, come into this knowledge um, pertaining to African studies, more science, um, the teachings of Noble Drali. Also, how, what made you become a professor? What made you become a scholar, which is su such rare within our, you know, we know the YouTube scholars, but actual, actual <laughs> academic scholar. How did you become that? Yes, sir. From the time that I was a teenager, I would listen to my Uncle Johnny. I often talk about my Uncle Johnny Foster Bay who was a part of the Morris Science Temple since the early 50s. I think he said he joined in 1952. So we're talking about long before I was even thought about or born. But when I got to be in high school, I was paying more attention to the things my uncle was sharing about, again, our identity. It was unusual because, you know, I grew up, as you pointed out, I grew up on Long Island, you know, in New York. Um, in a community that was made up of Europeans, Africans, Asians, um, even some Native American peoples. In fact, one of my neighbors uh, was Shinnecock, you know, the Shinnecock Nation, which is there on yes. Long Island. So I grew up in an environment that was very diverse. And um, my uncle was talking about Moorish history. My uncle was talking about the importance of knowing who we are as African peoples, but he also used terms like Asiatic, right? So I'm hearing this and you can imagine again, being in high school and not understanding the context and I would ask him and he would explain, but then he used to tell me about the legacy of our contribution. And I said, well, where is this you know, coming from? And I found out, I think I was maybe 14, 15 years old, more about the Morris Science Temple of America. Now, my father wasn't a member. My father was originally from Cuba, born in Cuba. My mother's family, although, as I would learn later, and you know, there are no happenings, law governs all events, there was a Moroccan and Moorish connection on my mother's side although the family came primarily from, in terms of the connection, Bermuda and Barbados. So it was the Bermudian side that made reference to some person who was, uh, had a Spanish name, but was actually Moroccan. What I could deduce is that this was basically what's known as, you know, the Western Sahara or Spanish Sahara all of which, for those of us who know anything about the history of the Moors, the Moorish Empire at one time extended as far south as the Senegal and, and Niger rivers, and as far east, essentially as almost the border of Egypt, in terms of the, the breadth of what was recognized as part of the Moorish Empire on the continent that we know as Africa. But long story short, this is information that was being um, shared with me in small bites from my uncle Johnny, um, and I started to ask questions, even of um, my um, high school teachers who was social, you know, taught social studies, um, Spanish teacher who you know the Moors, of course. The problem was the tendency was always put in the context of being Arabs. <laughs> so long story short, the foundations 
for me wanting to pursue the knowledge, say, of Moorish history began with my uncle Johnny, who'd been a part of the Moorish science movement since the early 50s. Then when I went to college and I decided um, I wanted to study both biology and history, and then ended up becoming a history major with an interest then on looking at the history even of science, which is what I would do later on with my master's thesis. And I just kept going deeper and deeper into looking at this legacy and saying, good heavens, all this information about who we are, which is kind of hidden in plain view, because most of what people were saying, of course, as you can imagine, in the 80s and, and 90s, and this is the period I'm talking about now, early 90s, but mostly in the 80s, only history we had was slavery mm -hmm. or civil rights. If we talked about the history of our people, it was always in the context of Black history. But I also asked the question, why is it that other ethnic communities or nationalities, if you will, didn't identify themselves as yellow Americans? So friends of mine who were Chinese friends of mine who were from uh, India, um, who identified themselves as Indians or as Chinese, etc., and yet didn't make Chinese or Asian synonymous with the term yellow. So all of these things started to make me think about what's the psych, uh, what's the psychological aspect of this as well. My uncle had already explained to me why Europeans were identifying themselves as white, right? White means purity, purity means God, and God means basically the ruler of the land. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could grasp that. And of course, I'm, I'm fairly certain that many in, in, um, in your listening audience would understand when they think of people like uh, Malcolm or others who would comment on all the negative uh, terms or negative meaning associated with black, right? So I started to recognize the importance of looking more closely at who we are in the context of how we are identified historically. When I did the research on the Moors, brother man, and I started finding out that uh, black and more had basically kind of been this term in English to move us from being understood as Moors to have us being designated as, as blacks ultimately, and then if you will, Negroes or Negroes. So, uh, I mean, in short, I'm trying to cover, of course, a lot of information in terms of influences, but the primary influence came from my uncle mm -hmm. by a desire to know for myself intellectually, because my, my uncle didn't go to college. And I often said my uncle didn't go to college, but he was still, one of the wisest and most intelligent human beings that I've ever known. I said, let me take this information, go to college, go to university, look more closely at all these issues that I've just addressed in order to strengthen the knowledge of ourselves. Because I clearly saw just as I, I think what the Bible says, and I think it's Hosea, that my people suffer for lack of knowledge, right? And there again is this whole issue of why know thyself is a part of the Nile Valley civilization. It's why the Greeks would adopt it. It's why the Romans would adopt it. It's why university systems would be established in the medieval period, founded largely on what the Moors and the Islamic world were bringing into the West. To do what? Know thyself. Study who we are, right? What's our relationship to our creator, right? Because, of course, in the context of those periods, the vast majority of cultures on the, on the planet, and I would say beyond the planet, understand and have understood there's a spiritual dimension to our existence, right? There's a spiritual dimension to our existence. And knowing what that spiritual dimension is empowers us, hopefully, to do greater good. 
because the empowerment is not then to be to drive ego it's to initiate the five principles right love truth peace freedom and justice so i mean in short those were the primary um, influences on why I decided to pursue the study of history and then decided, of course, to become an academic and in particular to teach at the university and college level or levels, because I recognized the only way we were going to improve our situation was to have individual men and women, brothers and sisters in the so-called ivory towers, studying, teaching, writing, sharing this information so as to you know, correct all the misrepresentations of who we are as African people, if you will, African peoples, I would once put it or we would say as Asiatics in the context of knowledge science, we had to take control of our own narrative, our own historical and cultural narrative. But we had to do so in a way where we really had done the work, right? Learned to think critically, read, critiqued, etc. cetera. So. Absolutely, absolutely. That's excellent. Now, that brings me to your book, which I want to, um, which I see as proof of your work of what you're saying. Um, Othello's Children in the New World, Moorish History and Identity in the African American Experience. Excellent book. If you don't have it, please get it. I did post the link. You can get it at Amazon. Um, what inspired you to write this book mm. in particular? Um, that book was largely written specifically for our community, by our, I'm saying the Moorish American community. The reason I, and that, again, I wasn't saying those who didn't identify as Moorish American were not part of my motivation. Uh, and, uh, and this was something that I had thought about for, I'd say at least a decade via conversations with my uncle over the years. Um, and my, my uncle uh, made transition in 1998, but I would say around 1990 is when I started talking with him about saying, you know, I really need to write something that clarifies the historicity, meaning the authenticity of what Noble Drawley, Prophet Noble Drawley conveyed to us in the early part of the 20th century. Because most people still thought, when I read the existing literature, that Noble Drew Ali made this stuff up. Mm -hmm. Justification for calling us Moors this is what people thought. There was no justification for a unique interpretation of the religion of Islam. They thought there was no justification for us saying that we were within the Americas long prior to Columbus, and that there was also an, uh, a considerable importance attached to declaring our nationality officially, to say this is who we are, We're, we have a nationality, and here it is. Those things of, of particular importance, then I would say, and that to do so meant that you would find yourself being recognized as a full citizen in the United States, as opposed to one who exists under what Drew Ali called a granted privilege, right? So the reason for that book was to have in one place for those who were in more science already to say, let me see if there's, if there's any source material, if you will, objective material that can be used to justify and or explain what the Moorish literature 
and what the Moorish Science Temple has been teaching since the 1920s, um, which is why even the style of it, I was talking to a, a colleague a couple of months ago, and I said, this book, the style of it was written for the layperson. I didn't write that piece for an academic audience. Stylistically, that's why I'll use italics, I'll highlight, et cetera. The focus of the book is to, to first and foremost empower those within the Moorish science temple communities to have, uh, if you will, a reference that they can use to say, here are secular sources as opposed to the sacred sources within our own sacred literature that mm -hmm. validate what our prophet and founder was teaching, you know, a hundred years ago, right. you know, and I'll, I'll add one other thing that relates to this. I was recently asked by a, um, another historian who's writing a book um, addressing uh, the pre-Columbian history of the Americas. And I was asked, you know, to give my perspective in terms of more science, right? And what I essentially, I mean, there were a number of things that we discussed, but what was most fascinating, I think, for him as well was, and I point this out in my own book, In a Fellow's Children, Zhu Ali was talking about these things before people like Barry Fell, even the late great Ivan Van Sertima, Michael Bradley, um, R.A. Jazerboy, um, and, and other um, anthropologists and historians who were looking at the pre-Columbian presence. Now, mind you, yes, Martin Delaney made reference to a, a pre-Columbian African presence in reference to the Carthaginians. There were, were stories in terms of like folklore, like American folklore, that made reference to contacts with the old world. And that old world included both um, the African continent as well as Europe uh, and, and, uh, and Asia. Um, but what was unique was why was it or how was it that noble Drew Ali, Timothy Drew Ali, in the 1920s, right? And if you want to go back, of course, to the Canaanite temple, right, in terms of 1913, um, but just, you know, for the sake of what we have in terms of the Moorish literature, by the 1920s is overtly sharing this information about a pre-Columbian presence of African peoples in the Americas to the rank and file population known as a, or so-called Negro communities. That essentially was unheard of, right? To have this so openly shared. It was part of other traditions. People have often talked about connections uh, like to, to masonry, or maybe even to um, uh, Rosicrucian orders or, or other semi-secret groups. But this is something that he was sharing with the, if you will, the general public and giving, giving it a context that was much more meaningful, mm -hmm. would argue, yes. uh, because of the connection to the spiritual or the divine aspect and to being better citizens. I mean, this thing was just so, it was constructed so brilliantly that, uh, I mean, it's easy for me to see why one would recognize this as the signs of a prophet. And yes, there are many prophets. Yes. Rather, um, I think, obnoxious for some folks to think that a certain group of people can't have a prophet, someone who comes to bring them some message, uh, whatever chaos or, uh, or um, troubles that they're presently in, usually because of what? A lack of knowledge. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you made something very clear. Something I, I usually say is that Noble Drew Ali 
Prophet Noble Drali was is the forerunner of what we call today the conscious community. Mm. If you look at what we view as the conscious community, regardless of what group you're in and the platforms that are out there today, he was basically expressing what a lot of these various um, individuals are expressing now, meaning mm -hmm. when you talk about the pre-Columbian mm -hmm. uh, existence of us, whether it's that, if, you, if you're into the whole aspect of the indigenous, as he has that covered. Of course, the Moors of, of um, Africa, you can't, that goes without mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. But also Kemet, <laughs> he goes in it, we got that covered. Yes. Um, yes. And the metaphysical. Yes. It's like, it's all there. And this was like you said, we talk in 1913 to the 1920s. And we're in 2021 at the most, you know, a lot of these brothers was doing their thing in, in the nineties, you know, right. real heavy, right. you know, but um, so that brings me to uh, the particular chapter in your book, chapter six, uh, which is dealing, the title of it is more science, Muslims, uh, Marabouts and Masons and intersecting heritage. And you just mentioned about the Masons. Mm -hmm. So what I like about it is that, of course, in here, as you alluded to, you made reference to the Moors Quran, um, the Holy Quran and the Moors Science Temple of America. Many of us professionally refer to it as Circle 7, and um, specifically Chapter 35. Now, you also go into later on, you give a definition of, um, you go from Webster's Dictionary, the definition of the uh, Theos Theosophical. 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 Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. in which you say, and I quote, a religious or semi-religious sect of occult beliefs rejecting Judeo-Christian revelation and theology, often incorporating elements of Buddhism and Brahmanism and held to be based on a special mystical insight or on superior speculation. Now, we know with more science, um, of course, it's a divine national movement. There's the aspect mm -hmm. of the nationality, but there's also a lot of mysticism in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in your opinion, and this is pertaining to Western theology, because like you said, a lot of the thought is that this information is uh, kind of diametrically opposed to that um, train of thought. Why do you think that Western theology uh, lacks or does it lack mystical insight of the Eastern traditions? I think in the context you know, of what theosophy means, to, to say that it rejects the Judeo-Christian, um, if you will, interpretation, right? of God or of, you know, what it is for humanity to be connected to what we recognize as a God force or a God spirit. Um, it isn't a rejection of every aspect of what we know to be a part of Judaism or every aspect of what we know to be a part of Christianity. And the reason for that is fairly simple, I would suggest. Truth is going to be found everywhere, right? Truth is going to be in various places at various times. How cultures inter interpret that truth, right, will be different based upon the time, the location. So when, for example, um, you have Christians, say, in, in the present, who largely believe that the earliest followers of the man we know as the Christ or Jesus or uh, Yeshua ben Mariam, there are Christians in the present who believe that Jesus and what we know of Jesus 
was the same in the first century AD as it is in 2021. They don't understand that there was a diversity of belief about what it meant to follow this man who will become known as the Christ. So consequently, I can say, and from using the definition in terms of theosophy, I can say that I agree with aspects of the Judeo-Christian revelation, but disagree with other aspects. Because if I'm looking at the early church, or let me back up, not the church, if I'm looking at the early communities, you had Gnostics, you had adoptionists, you had uh, Ebionites, you had Docetists. These different groups of Christians had a different understanding. And in fact, I, I even hesitate to say Christian because they weren't calling themselves Christian in the beginning. Calling themselves Christians is a later phenomenon, almost a, a hundred years or at least 60, 70 years after the birth of what, the one we know as, as, as the Christ. So if you have people who say, we believe that Jesus is God in and of himself, he is the son of God by himself, begotten, not made, right? That essentially is, is the traditional interpretation in most Christian communities from the Roman Catholic Church, and then even into other Protestant traditions, begotten, not made. The idea of saying that suggests that that's what people thought at the very beginning, but that's not true. There were sects who saw Jesus as a master teacher, whose agenda was to get all of us to recognize the unity of man and if you will, God. And by man, I mean manifest, female and male, right? It's not a patriarchal thing in this context, right? Man, the manifestation, man, to get humanity to recognize the divinity within ourselves through a process of, if you will, preparation, right? What are you, where do you put your attention? Where do you put your focus? Are you committed to trying to do everything you can to activate that consciousness within? And lo and behold, what do we find out primarily in the 20th century and the 21st century? That there is evidence that Jesus traveled to, to study with, if you will, those in the Hindu communities, and those associated with Buddhism. Now, again, to go back to, to our point, your, you know, your point you just made not so long ago about um, Drew Ali basically being the forerunner to a lot of these so-called new age or progressive ways of thinking in terms of you know, our, our, our spirituality or spiritual science. Some people see that as a problem because they suggest that it's something evil because they're, they're, they're looking at it and saying, oh, how dare you say that you are part of the God force. But Jesus said that, even what survives in the Bible, right? So Buddhism, whose agenda is to get us, as they say, to enlightenment, and a lot of that emphasis is on meditation and going within, being still, right? Buddhism, which believes in reincarnation, as does Hinduism. Clearly, that doesn't fit into mainstream Christianity, nor does it fit into mainstream Judaism, right? So people will often try to criticize and say, well, look, this belief is all over the place. Because you got people who believe in reincarnation, but they believe in Jesus. Can't do that because Jesus did. So what do you mean you can't do that? How much time, this is a question I always ask, how much time have these people who are critical spent studying the early followers of Jesus, right? 
even someone like um, Elaine Pagels, who was a Princeton theologian, who became, uh, um, a, say, a, a specialist to a, to a large degree in Gnosticism. And then you have people asking the question of whether Gnosticism is, is largely a particular interpretation of Judaism, or is it more of an influence from the uh, Greco-Roman mystery schools, which we know the Greco-Roman mystery schools have roots in what? Egypt, again. And then we know that Egypt shares some parallels in terms of its spiritual beliefs with the Indus Valley. Ultimately, I'll say it again. The purpose for us is to just get to the truth, the truth, that which never changes. So when I look at Judaism or I look at Christianity and I see in the 21st century, there's a particular understanding of what that means. Or I look at uh, Al-Islam, whether it's Sunni or Shia or Karahite or, you know, of course we can talk about the Sufis and um, the Marabouts, the Murids, these different traditions or even Native American spiritual beliefs, looking at the Hopi, looking at the uh, um, the Diné, or looking at any number of, you know, the hundreds, of course, of indigenous American spiritual traditions that believe what? In reincarnation. That believe in this idea of judgment. Judgment for what? Whether you do good in the world or not. Because if we're in our right mind, our purpose, our raison d'etre, a reason for being, is to do good in the world, bring good in the world. I remember any number of times Dr. Milena Karanga, in reference to Ma'at, talking about this same idea, right? That the ancient Kemetic texts are largely trying to get us to do good in the world. Now people say, yeah, but all the craziness that was going on in Nile Valley civilizations. Yeah, yeah, clearly there's craziness going on in all civilizations. But the question is whether there was a spiritual tradition that tried to get people to get right. And by right, and this is what I, I think I love uh, most about our own tradition in Moorish sciences, we break down what we understand to be, if you will, right thinking. Love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. And in that order, because if you come into something first with love, really you're going to go into truth with that same recognition. Then you can go into peace. Then you can respect freedom. Then you can seek justice. Because you can't get to justice until you've gone through the other four. You can't have justice if you have no love. You can't have justice if you have no truth. You can't have no, you, you can have no justice if there is no desire for peace. Something that should be so simple if we would just what? Be still and reflect on these things that Drew Ali through the Moorish Science Temple gave to us to prevent all the chaos and craziness Right, if we would follow it. Yes. Right. And um, again, it means I'm looking for truth wherever I can find it. I'm not interested, first and foremost, in dogma. Right. Dogma is what typically gets us in, I say, typically gets us in trouble. Mm. Looking for the foundational principles of anything, you know, it's when, it, when it comes to something like, um, uh, our spiritual practices so absolutely absolutely and you unpacked a lot there um staying on that topic real quick of jesus i have two questions and you can answer it in any order that you wish mm -hmm. one you mentioned about the sufis and of course um this show we were planning to speak on sufism what one what is the sufis view of jesus 
And again, any order you wish to answer these questions. In reference to the historicities of Jesus, one of the aspects is, of course, that as a child, he went to Egypt. And Egypt is a common denominator with many of the prophets of the Bible, Moses, Abraham, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So my question in that aspect is for our, our Christian brothers and sisters mm -hmm. who, who kind of dismiss the, the, the Egyptian sciences and the, the history of that as far as that connection, how important is Egypt, Kemet, to the, um, the Judeo-Christian uh, dynamic? Let me actually, I'm gonna quote you something um, that I think you'll find valuable. Uh, and this, this is coming from a, uh, a Egyptologist, okay? And by foundational meaning, if you mention James Breasted, B-R-E-A-S-T-E-D, who spent a lot of time studying Nile Valley civilization. In fact, Daga quotes him in his book, Ma'at, The Moral Ideal in Ancient Egypt. But here's what James Breasted said, and I quote, the Nile Valley, which is 3,000 years older than that of the Hebrews, contributed essentially to the formation of the Hebrew literature, which we call the Old Testament. Our moral heritage, therefore, derives from a wider human past, enormously older than the Hebrews. And it has come to us rather through the Hebrews than from them. Mm. That particular quote, I think, helps and summarize well what we're looking at here. So when people, for example, look at something like circumcision, which is known to seal the covenant in accordance with Judaism. The Bible itself says in the Old Testament that the circumcising cultures included the Egyptians. Egypt is far older than Judaism. There is no Judaic tradition until later, right? So circumcision, which is intended to then establish the covenant between the circumcised, the people of God in the context of Judaism and um, God, Jehovah or Yahweh in the context again of, of Jewish belief. Circumcision is even found on the tombs. There's something known as the tomb of the doctor that exists in Kemet. And it's like a thousand years older than the date that most theologians give for the existence of Abraham. So of course, you're talking about uh, the beginnings of Judaism being with the patriarch Abraham, but Egypt had already existed and the Egyptians were circumcising. They were circumcising culture. That's what breasted some of the things he's alluding to. The idea of judgment, the earliest references to judgment are found in ancient Kemetic texts in terms of a, you know, a, 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 um, being judged for your actions, you know, for doing good, bringing good in the world. The concept of ma'at, of course, is even a, a part of that. The idea of believing that there is one sent from God, an anointed one, right? In the Greek, it's Christos, the anointed one. The translation, of course, in the English is the Christ, right, or Christ. But the word, krast, its earliest etymology is found in Nile Valley civilization, in Moduneche. So even the concept of an anointed one, one sent from God, one sent from the heavens, 
Egypt. This idea of the Ten Commandments, people often refer to the negative confessions that are also found among the ancient Egyptians long before there is Judaism. So in terms of you know, the importance of Egypt to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, because those three monotheistic traditions are still seen to be coming out of Egypt in terms of serious influences, spiritual strong influences. Before I forget, this is, I think a fairly easy to answer. You asked also about how Sufis look at Jesus. I'd, I would say that the as far as I understand, all Sufis, or just to be safe, the vast majority of Sufis would see Jesus as a prophet, as a prophet who was setting the example for us to follow, right? So the idea of saying, this person sets the example, he was who he claimed to be. Mm -hmm. he to, to take his power from the source, the source being the father, who was the father, the father of all of us. In fact, even in the biblical tradition, Jesus doesn't say when he teaches us, uh, meaning those who believed in him, teaches us to, to pray. He doesn't say, Jesus is father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He says, our father who art in heaven. This emphasis upon us recognizing that we are the children of the Most High God. In Arabic, the word would be Allah. But recognizing that we are connected by virtue of what? By virtue of us having the Holy Breath, the Holy Spirit within us. And by virtue of us choosing to activate the higher self as our guiding principle. Once we, you know, what is said right? Or good is as good does. If your commitment is as Jesus, Jesus's commitment was to do good and bring good into the world and be of service, you are reflecting the great God of the universe. Because, and I said reflecting, that's coming through you by virtue of those, uh, uh, of that decision, that choice to follow those, those principles, right? And to be able to do it essentially unceasingly means that you will start to acquire the level of, of um, uh, deity or divinity that's classically associated with men and women who bring such good to the world. Well, we're still talking about them thousands of years you know, later. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so this brings me to another question, because you answered a lot of my questions with that <laughs> particular statement. Um, what I want to, if you can give me, because we're going to keep in the line of Sufism and also ancient Kemet, mm -hmm. can you give the audience uh, a historical breakdown of the connection between those Eastern traditions as it pertains to Western occultism, specifically um, dealing with the societies, you mentioned about the Rosicrucians, the Masons, like, can you give the audience a breakdown historically? Probably the, the easiest way to, to explain it. Sufism is an expression of Islam. Islam as a religion coming out of the sixth and seventh centuries of the common era. Following that period, you'll have some communities in the Islamic world or in these Islamic societies that feel the need to have some greater connection, right? Um, there are groups like the Druzi, for example, who have a unique understanding of Islam that unfortunately resulted in uh, many of the Sunni and even the Shia communities saying that they weren't really following, you know, proper Islam in accordance with how they had had uh, laid it out. But nevertheless, they exist and they presented their own understanding um, that tries to have humanity 
get in touch with our divine selves, the Allah in man, mm -hmm. through meditation, or, you know, in the Turkish tradition, the whirling dervishes, you know, where they'll spin to try to work themselves into a kind of um, meditative state, right? Um, this is something that essentially is coming right out, you know, following the time of the, of the Arab prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all the prophets. So that to me is, is probably the easiest way to say what the beginnings are for what we will know as, as Sufism, and it'll spread to other parts of the world. Um, most Sufism is associated with ancient or, or medieval, rather, Persia, right, which is modern day Iran. So that when one talks about um, the Sufi tradition, particularly in the West, a lot of those influences are coming in by way of Iranian influences. Um, but there are also Sufi traditions, Ibn al-Arabi, who was in Al-Andalus uh, in the um, 11th and 11th, 12th centuries in terms of the, the influence spreading. Um, and that's again of the common era. So that information is always from that time going to be accessible to those who seek it. The history of Al-Andalus, of course, is one where people were allowed to come in from any part of the world to study, as long as they weren't swinging, as I often joke and say, swinging a broadsword at folks, um, you know, at the, the Muslim population in Al-Andalus. People from all over, people came from Scotland, people came from England, people came from France, people came from uh, Eastern Europe, et cetera, to study in Al-Andalus, and what we know today is, as, as Spain, and, uh, and to some extent, Portugal. But that information, with the rise of the Reconquista, will find itself being increasingly um, pushed you know, down or, or, or uh, um, thwarted because it's at odds with the Roman Catholic Church. And it's actually at odds with what will become considered you know, mainstream Islam people had to kind of pull back uh, from letting folks know that their understanding of Islam was different or that their understanding of the Christ was different, you know, uh, in terms of what was happening within, within the church. Fast forward, because I mean, this is a lot, so I'm just trying to hit some of the high points. You fast forward to about the 16th century, 17th century, um, there is the expression of what we know as Freemasonry uh, and, um, you know, speculative Freemasonry and the Rosicrucian order, Christian Rosenkreutz, um, who was said to have traveled to uh, Morocco and studied among Moorish Sufis or Moorish mystics. And that's the foundation for the order of the Rosy cross or, or Rosicrucianism, which also, of course, puts emphasis upon what? Nile Valley civilization. Um, and the Rosicrucian order still, you know, exists uh, uh, to, this, to this day. Um, those traditions will influence then other groups that will exist in parts of um, Europe, um, what is it like the Thule Society and, and other organizations, the, the what is it, Golden Dawn and these sorts of things that um, one can have a problem with at certain points if you start to see them falling away from the essential principles, right? And that's something I think is signed. Um, the analogy that I love to use is, is the same thing that exists in the Star Wars series. The force can be used for good, hence you have the Jedi. The force can be used for evil, hence you have the Sith. They're utilizing the same spiritual understanding of power. 
but one group is committed to using it, if you will, in the interest of the higher self. The other group is committed to using it for their own egotistical purposes. And, it, and, and they'll pay for that, right? The whole thing, I would say, exists when you start to look at these so-called new age groups or different interpretations. Because if you're not motivated, always motivated by seeking the greater good or the greatest good, the purpose of this, if I'm studying this, is to bring greater good, love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Greater love, greater truth, greater peace, greater freedom, greater justice into this world and beyond. If that's if I'm caught up in my ego, obviously, I'm you know one could end up using something for, as they say, ill purposes or for you know, evil purposes. Um, I've had people tell me stories over the last twenty years of family members, for example, who were Masons, who were able, they said, or Shriners to do certain things that they didn't think were very, um, very good, but because they use certain science, quote unquote, their own ego-driven purposes. Mm -hmm. Ironically, uh, at least in one of the cases that I remember someone shared, things didn't go well for the person who used it to that end, right? And then the same thing, even when we people talk about what's his name, Crowley and others. This is where the day, if you talk about the pitfalls or the dangers, if your motivation is always higher self, the mother of the virtues and the harmonies of life, right? That breeds justice, mercy, you know, uh, uh, um, love and right. Right. You're talking about something that will keep you grounded in the way that the Christ, Jesus, was grounded, right? That's why, you know, to kind of bring it back, especially if we have Christian sisters and brothers who may be listening, we as Moorish Americans, more science, we don't reject Jesus. The Circle 7 of the Quran embraces Jesus. These lessons are for all those who love Jesus. And it's not just idle words, at least not in terms of the way it was conveyed. You may find Moors who for them it's idle words because they're not following essentially what's there. But I'm saying in the context of Moorish science, we keep Jesus as a focal point. He is our standard, which is kind of uncomfortable for some people if they're part of Orthodox Islam to say, well, wait a minute, if you all are Muslims or Muslims, why aren't you focusing on Muhammad, right? Why is Jesus such a, such a focal point? And I discuss that in more detail in my book, but the reason is because Jesus is understood to be very important because he's the one who's known across these traditions for essentially activating the divinity of the God force within and trying to get us to do the same. Right. That, was, that was essentially what he, he came to do. Right. Like, you know, what's not to love about, and I, I'll say this and then I'll stop for a second because we're almost out of time here. Um, I teach a course, Introduction, to Christianity, which where well, the focus is specifically, it's called understandings of Christianity. And inevitably, I'll have students who will tell me that they are not Christian anymore, or you know, Christians are hypocrites. They've seen this and that and the other, and I mean, they use words as strong as hatred. And I say to them, "What's to hate about Jesus Christ?" And inevitably, the vast majority of them realize, well, no, it's because I've seen this past do that, that was wrong, or this past do that, that was evil, or this people call them, and I said, but don't blame Jesus Christ for that, right? Don't blame Jesus for that. 
So for us in Moorish science, we affirm, we elevate Jesus, but we also understand that Jesus is a prophet whose intention was to get us to activate the Christ spirit within us by doing what? Living in accordance with love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Could it get any simpler? Right? Okay. So we people make religion so complicated when ultimately it comes down to just what are your ideals and are you committed to manifesting those ideals to the best of your ability? You know, there's a quick story in, in my book when I talk about the Conestoga Indian chief mm -hmm. who, who in the 1750s basically uh, was trying to, he was being uh, uh, proselytized or an attempt to proselytize him by a Christian missionary in central Pennsylvania. And this Indian chief and in listening to this, he said, everything you're sharing with me and telling me is in this book is already written in our hearts. We live in accordance with being brotherly and sisterly and being good and doing good. We don't need a book, you know, to tell us that. Yes. Essentially, it's the, it's the same, same thing. He said, these were things that were given to us long before in terms of our own ancestral connections. It's just up to us to make the com commitment to follow them. Absolutely, absolutely. And definitely, I have, we, if it was up to me, we go for five hours, but I know uh, you're a busy man. I definitely appreciate your time. Um, again, everyone, please, if you have not gotten this book, please get it. It's a wealth of information. I have learned so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Bay. You're and, welcome. Uh, if there's, let me just say this. Yes, sir. I've got four minutes. If you had, because uh, we just saw a little late, and I, I mean, I can if absolutely you have another quick question or or whatever. I'd be happy to answer it before I I. I have yes, to, this I should be real quick. Um, who are the Morabots? I hope that's quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the Moabites are associated. Uh, with being descendants of people from the land of Moab. Oh, my apologies. I, I mispronounced it. Morabots. Moraboots. Moraboots. Oh, the Moraboots. Ah, yes. 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 The Moraboots. The Moraboots is a reference to a community that was predominantly African and Muslim, yes. living in areas of West Africa, um, were known essentially as defenders of the faith. Um, especially with the rise of um, the, the Roman Catholic powers uh, during the, the Reconquista, etc. But they're also associated with the al Moravids, which was one of the dynasties that arises in West Africa as well in the, um, in the 11th uh, uh, century, uh, end of the 10th, early 11th century. Um, and they're often associated with, with having a, a different interpretation of Islam. They were thought to be reformers. They were trying to reform the, um, the religion of Islam as they felt that it was becoming, um, what's the word? It, it was looking too foreign mm -hmm. to how it was practiced uh, in West Africa. Um, they sought to make it a bit more provincial in its orientation. Um, Sheikh Anja Jup, when he talks about uh, how African societies often made religion uh, a living religion, meaning that they tried to allow it to morph or grow in the context of the culture in which it existed, provided it didn't lose, this goes back to what I said before, the essential principles, right? What are the principles that that are you know that are in place? So I mean that would be the uh, uh, the short say or a uh, somewhat short answer to what is meant by um, Madhavuts. They're um, uh, living saints. They're 
referred to also. Uh, they're also known as Sidis, which means lords. They're also referred to as teachers or mulis. They were said to have powers of healing and defying gravity. Um, and um, one other thing that I find interesting, um, some of the indigenous peoples in the Americas, like American Indian surnames, Marabios, hmm. Marabitine. And this is, is a big deal because what it clearly uh, suggests, very strongly um, suggests, is that these Marabouts were also, their influence would also make it to the Americas, you know. But that's a conversation perhaps for another uh, uh, another another time. So great. Uh, uh, I guess we, we, are, we would be out of time, but uh, for those who are interested, I do discuss it in more detail in um, in uh, in my book as well. Gratitude. Definitely. Dr. Bay, it's been an honor and pleasure um, having this time with you. Um, you are always welcome on this platform. And if there's anything I can do on my end to help extend your information through this platform, you're always welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bay. Thank, yes. thank you, Brother Shemiel. I, I really appreciate the invitation and I thank you for your, your great work. So keep up right. the good work, brother. Appreciate you, brother. And, and you and to everyone listening and to you, Brother Shemiel, I'm, uh, I'm gonna say peace and love. Peace and love. Love.